Since its origin in late antiquity, when the veneration of tombs housing the relics of martyrs began, the cult of saints has constantly encompassed a miraculous aspect. The earliest accounts, known as Patients of the Martyrs, and subsequently older geographic writings, such as Gregory the Great's Dialogues from the 6th century, depicted the saints as having the ability to influence people's well-being, both during their lifetime and more prominent, prominently after their death, affecting cures or for ailments often deemed incurable. This thaumaturgical dimension of saints, emulating the miraculous power of Christ, stands as a defining characteristic of holiness in early Christianity. Furthermore, as time progressed, particularly from the 11th and the 12th centuries onward, and with the advent of modern history, this dimension became an integral part of the process for confirming for confirming a candidate's sanctity, serving as an indispensable criterion for inclusion in the roster of saints and subsequent veneration. The thaumaturgical aspect of saints, modeled after Christ, stands as a distinct hallmark of early Christian holiness. Um, the profound connection between the history of thaumaturgy and the history of medicine is evident. Numerous geographic sources from the medieval and early modern periods reveal the close intertwining of these seemingly disparate dimensions. A geographic text frequently mention and describe illnesses, occasionally alluding to the efforts of physicians, at times attesting to their inability to effect cures. While the theme of a physician's inability to heal through, hum through human alone science is a well-documented literary motive, consider the case, for example, of San Pantaleon, a physician who achieved his greatest healings only after his conversion to Christianity. It is apparent that both realms coexist as possible avenues for healing. Consequently, the history of miraculous healings serves as a valuable do domain for comparison and reflection, offering data, references, and description that can significantly enrich the history of medicine, particularly during the Middle Age and the early modern period. During this time, geographic sources become more detailed and the commencement of canonization processes yielded acts that captured the voices of the people, among them some physicians, who often provided lively and spontaneous accounts of illnesses, remedies and recoveries. In this talk, I will present a few cases where accounts of saints' miracles contained in the canonization trials allow us to glimpse various aspects of medical practice and healing, as well as to shed light on patients' perception of illness and what was considered as a deviation from the normal course of nature. I shall begin this talk with providing some details about Saint Angelo from Jerusalem, later known as Saint Angelo from Licata, due to the location of his obvious martyrdom. He was a Carmelite prior, hailing from Palestine, who lived during the 12th and 13th century. The first accounts of his life, the Vita Sancti Angeli, Life of Saint Angelo, by Enoch, is, relati is relatively late, dating back to the 15th century and originating from the Sicilian region. According to tradition, Angelo was born to Jewish parents, who later converted to Christianity after a divine dream. Along with his brother, he embraced the Carmelite order and embarked on a period of solitude in the desert, where he experienced visions that led him first to Alexandria in Egypt to acquire some relics and subsequently to Italy. While in Rome, there is an apocryphal account lacking historical reliability of his supposed encounter with the founders of the two other mendicant orders, St. Francis and St. Dominic. This episode was embellished by the geographer to lend credibility and legitimacy to the Carmelite order, which during those years was transitioning from a contemplative to a mendicant orientation, 
akin to the Franciscans and Dominicans. Euponius travels through various locations in Sicily and having converted many souls along the way, he eventually reached Licata. Here, his preaching clashed with a local lord named Berengario della Pulcella, who was engaged in an incestuous relationship with his sister, Margaret, and had children from her. Allegedly, it was in the church of St. Philip St. James in Licata that Angelo was fatally stabled. This episode led to his remembrance as a martyr. If the details surrounding Angelo's life are somewhat questionable and of limited relevance to the reconstruction of his historical persona, the work Miracola et Beneficia, it has the miracles and graces, stands out as a con considerably more valuable source. The work consists of a comprehensive inquiry which delves into the miracles attributed to Saint Angelo, which took place in Licata. It was conducted under the guidance of the Bishop of Agrigento, the diocese in which the city was and remains situated. From a historical and medical standpoint, the trials that document the miracles attributed to saints hold significant relevance. The testimonies of those who describe experiencing a miraculous healing offer valuable insights into the ailments they suffered from. These testimonies frequently contain praises particulars, including the names of their illnesses, the treatments recommended by doctors, descriptions of surgical procedures they underwent, and even the dynamics of the doctor-patient relationship. Additionally, they illuminate the concurrent use of, a diverse, of diverse remedies, encompassing magical, folklorical, medical, and remedies linked to the veneration of saints. The notary responsible for composing this text and examining the witnesses was Jacopo Murci, who was a lay official. From the late Middle Ages, the role of notaries became increasingly important with the aim of drawing up and writing the testimonies in the canonical trials of the Catholic Church, accounts of miracles, canonization procedures, etc. Interestingly, interestingly, just a few years later, Murci also undertook an order Sicilian inquiry in Licata, this time pertaining to the servant of God, Father Sebastiano Siracusa from Caltabellotta, it's worth noting that Father Sebastiano had an initiated the canonization process, but has not yet been canonized himself. The investigation was carried out during the years 1625 to 1627. As to know, two copies of this inquiry are preserved. One, of, one is held in the General Archive of the Carmelite Order in Rome, dating back to 1627, and the order is located in the University Library of Cagliari, dated 6 to 1640. The text of this work, which has been condensed and adapted, was also translated into Latin by the Bolandist. While the work had been known in the past, it wasn't until recently that the first critical edition was undertaken and published by myself, for Carmelite editions. This text holds significant historical and documentary value as it comprises 113 testimonies from witnesses who recounted various miracles attributed to the saint. These miracles, in particular, were related to the outbreak of the plague, a subject I will revisit later in our discussion. In these years, Sicily was under Spanish domin dominion, a significant aspect that brought Licata and its bustling trading port into frequent interaction with Spanish people, a fact frequently alluded by to by the witnesses. Meanwhile, the administration of the island was overseen by a viceroy, and during the years of our focus, the incumbent viceroy succumbed to the plague in 1624. Licata itself was governed by a council of jurors. 
The trial concerning the miracles of Licata is not an isolated occurrence. In fact, during the same period, there were other trials and figures whose geographies were recorded. For example, there is the case of blessed Luigi Rabatà in Randazzo, located in eastern Sicily. Two inquiries from the 16th century, of which I have overseen the transcription, shed light on his life and miracles. Additionally, there is the case of San Benedetto o San Fratello, who became the focus of a series of canonization processes initiated in the early modern age and continued, and continued onwards. These trials and figures collectively contribute to a broader historical and religious context. The choice of Sicily, as exemplified in, this, in the discussed case, is far from coincidental. Over time, the island has served a, as a crossroads for various cultures and has been subjected to different dominations, resulting in a rich tapestry of knowledge and traditions. Notably, these include the Byzantine, Arab, and Jevin, Aragonese, and Spanish dominations, all of which have left their mark on the region. While this report does not delve into the influence and presence of these dominations in a geographic text, I would like to point out that my ongoing research is dedicated precisely to exploring this topic in greater depth. In essence, Sicily stands as a land of sanctity, akin to other regions of Italy, where numerous canonization processes have occurred, often intertwined with historical and medical themes. Furthermore, its geographical distance from Rome and the Pope, particularly during the years when the canonization process underwent reform under the decrees of Pope Urban VIII, gives Sicily a unique dimension. This dimension allows for the preservation and description of specific territorial cult practices and traditions that may differ from those found in other parts of Italy. In the trial related to the miracle attributed to Saint Angelo, a plethora of testimonies can be found, each providing intricate accounts of the various illnesses people endured. These encompassed fever, both tertian and quartan, joint ailments, leg fractures, injuries resulting from conflicts or workplace accidents, bruises, eye infections and inflammation, epilepsy, and complications during childbirth. These records furnish valuable historical and medical perspective, greeting us a glimpse into the health, into the health conditions and medical procedures of the period, as well as into the dynamic between conventional medical practices and faith-based healing. One of the most notable categories of ailments in the Sicilian text concerning St. Angelo's miracles is hernia, referred to as rottura in Sicilian and occasionally with the colloquial term guallara. Hernia was a widespread condition, not only in Sicily, but also in various regions during the Middle Ages and early modern age. It primarily affected children, often infants or twos a few years old, with a particular focus on the genital area, which was colloquially referred to as buttons, in Sicilian bottoni. However, there were also recorded cases of adults, typically males, suffering from this condition. The descriptions of hernias in these accounts often highlight the severity of the ailment reflecting the despair experienced by those afflicted. Witnesses described two primary medical interventions. <clears throat> herniary girdle, uh, many individuals resorted to using a herniary girdle or bracale in Sicilian, is in an attempt to contain the hernia. This was a non-invasive approach aimed at promoting support and relief. Surgical intervention. In some cases, surgical procedures were performed by barber surgeons, known as cerusici. However, surgery was considered daunting, especially for children, and was associated with fear and apprehension. Additionally, it carried risks, 
including the potential for scaring. Sant'Angelo was sought after by many in Licata as a source of healing for this distressing condition. These accounts not only provide insight into the prevalence of hernias during that era, but also shed light on the medical practices and the interventions of the time, as well as the profound impact of fate and the desire for miraculous cures on the lives of those, so of those who suffered from such ailments. An illustrative case involves a child who suffered from a severe hernia to such an extent that, as the witness recounts, there were occasions when it was necessary to invert the child to reposition the intestine. In another instance uh, that you can see on, uh, on the slide, the sole effective remedy for curing another child appeared to be surgery. However, the child's father was hesitant about subjecting his son to such a procedure because of his young age. Conversely, the child's relatives believed that surgery was the best course of action. On a particular day, these relatives went to collect the child who was under the care of the Carmelite priors, but Father Sebastiano Siracusa, uh, who we have mentioned it before, as he was aware of the parents' objections, declined to allow them to take the child. In response, following the St. Prior's guidance, the parents turned to the saint's intervention, following the same Prior's, uh, uh, applying, uh, sorry, turned to the saint's intervention, applying water from the site of the saint's martyrdom to the affected area. Within a short period, they witnesses the complete disappearance of the ailment. Uh, we can fastly read uh, this case in English. Uh, being the witness, that is Angelo De Caci, at the age of a few months in swaddling clothes, he fell ill with a disease called fleshy hernia in the testicles, the uh, Sicilian bottoni. So serious that he could not rest from the pain, since the testicles were very swollen. At the age of seven, the witness was still ill. An expert doctor named Antonio Pupo came to the city from the village area, and some relatives had tried to convince the witness father to have him cut by this doctor, certain that in this way he would recover. But the father refused to do so, both because of the danger of the cut and because of his suffering and at seeing such cruelty carried out on his son's body, saying that he hoped that he would be healed by the saint. This example highlights a fascinating dialectic among the different individuals involved regarding the necessity and prudence of performing surgery of the child for this healing. The decision to turn to the saint as a final option underscores the perceived risks associated with the surgical procedure, which the child's father vehemently wished to avoid, primary to spare his child from such suffering. Another crucial aspect pertains to St. Angelo's Chapel, which resided within the Church of St. Philip St. James, now, now known as the Sanctuary of St. Angelo. This chapel contained, and contained also now, a silver urn, reconstructed at the start of the 17th century to replace the aging one. Consequently, the chapel served as the focal point for devotion in this sacred place and was adorned with ex votos, items left by devotees not so much to request a grace, as was common in some shrines, but rather to express gratitude to the saint for blessing received. Regrettably, noting remains of these ex votos today, of which we only know about about thanks to this documentation. According to the accounts of witnesses, the chapel was replete with painted or inscribed plaques bearing a witness to favor received. 
Additionally, a prevalent offering was the hernia belt. Many individuals afflicted with hernias left behind the belts they had worn, typically made of metal, as a testament to the blessing they had received. In one miraculous case involving a child, the father, with the constant of the Carmelite friars who administered the church, with the consent of the Carmelite friars, visited the chapel to replace his son's hernial belt. As the one he had been using was ill-suited and caused, and caused skin abrasions. The presence of numerous ex votos, particularly the hernia belts, clearly highlighted to devotees one of the saints' principal areas of miraculous intervention. A distinct form of affliction discussed in geographies, particularly in miracle or canonization trials, is diabolic passation. These cases typically involve individuals who exhibit symptoms such as delirium, convulsions, loss of bodily control, aggression, and occasionally paralysis and fevers. Here we encounter a complex category that encompasses both the spiritual and medical dimensions, and this complexity is reflected in the treatments employed. In the context of St. Angelo's miracles, Numerous instances of possessions are documented, many of which involving women. These cases are often resolved by escorting, sometimes forcibly, the possessed person to the saint's relics, where a prize performs the exorcism ritual and commands the malevolent spirit to depart. One particularly poignant case is that of Vincenzo Palizzi, a man from Palermo who journeyed to Licata, specifically seeking relief from his possession, following the advice of a local priest who had heard of the saint's reputation for miraculous healing. The exorcism in this instance is protracted and intricate, encompassing various stages during which the man experiences distressing symptoms, such as groaning, bleeding and screaming, while the occupying spirits within him speak and reveal their identities. Another significant case involves a young boy from Licata who one day wakes up paralyzed and unable to speak. Interestingly, his parents initially sought the help of a doctor, but when they realized that the abrupt onset of his condition the lack of, of any medical remedy and the unusual nature of his symptoms indicated a potential possession. They turned to the saint for assistance. Indeed, invoking the saint's intervention proved instrumental in the boy's recovery. While I cannot delve further into these instances of possession, it is essential to underscore their specificity. To interpret them correctly in the historical context of the early modern era, as well as in the Middle Ages and beyond, it is imperative to adopt an approach that facilitates a dialogue between medicine, folkloric beliefs, and religion. Let us briefly shift our focus away from the historical medical aspect and delve into the aspect of miracles or, or Taumaturgy. As mentioned earlier, Licata and the Church of St. James and Philip, today a shrine of St. Angelo, hold significance as the place where the Carmelite saints suffered martyrdom in, 12, in 1220. Following this event, the local population began venerating his remains. Initially, they placed his body in a wooden box and later it was enclosed within a silver arm. According to a geographies, a remarkable phenomena occurred at the site of the saint's martyrdom shortly after his death. A spring miraculously welled up precisely in the area, in the area where his lifeless body had lain. Additionally, on occasion, this spring would also exude oil 
although this phenomenon became less frequent over time. Indeed, the trial mentioned the oozing of oil in very few cases. Some traditions even suggest that a lily would bloom from the saint's body, and when removed, it would bloom once more. That is a tradition uh, common to other saints. Over the course of decades and centuries, the spring of water became the primary source of miracles in the saint's cult. It was thoughtfully arranged within a basin accessible by steps until the latter half of the 17th century. This basin was also supposed to feature a painted image of the martyred saint. Inside this area, which was eventually confined by, a, by small balustrades and now resembles a well, the eel would request permission to enter for baiting, and uh, the, um, the structure with balustrades is uh, in the picture. At times, uh, this request could be persistent, and the Carmelite friars had to intervene to prevent overcrowding, as was the case with a man suffering from dropsy. The water from the spring, as indicated by the trial sources, was available for drinking, either freely or at least under the supervision of the friars. On occasion, it was entirely accessible. The volume of water present was certainly substantial. In one incident, a child who fell into it was at, was at risk of drawing, but miraculously saved, according to accounts from relatives, by a mysterious friar believed to be Saint Angelo. Additionally, an oil lamp was lowered into the spring and raised at the end of each day. The water from the spring was also collected and sealed in containers by the University of Licata, the municipal institution. These containers were then distributed to individuals who requested it to take with them to other locations. Licata's status as an important trade center with a port welcoming vessels from across the Mediterranean generally greatly facilitated the spread, the spread of this miraculous liquid. Consequently, it also facilitated the exportation of the saint's cult which is documented in other places where the Carmelite friars are present, including Malta, Spain, and Sardinia. This miraculous water served various purposes. It was consumed primarily to treat internal illnesses or fevers and applied directly to afflicted body parts, including throw beds, for skin or external ailments. Historical sources also confirm the use of oil from the lamp that burned at the saint's tomb. This practice has deep roots in the history of tamaturgy and the cult of saints, dating back to late antiquity and originating in the martyr sanctuaries of the Middle East. The process involved soaking cotton, typically called uh, and made of bambaja, in the lamp oil and then applying the oil to the affected area. The belief was that this oil, having burned at the saint's tomb, absorbed the miraculous virtue present in the relics, thereby acquiring the same healing properties. The oil from St. Angelo's lamp was typically applied to the skin throughout smearing. The third significant thaumaturgical remedy was the chest of relics. At the beginning of the 17th century, alongside the creation of the new silver urn, the wooden chest containing the saint's bones, likely dating back to the 15th century, was replaced with a new one. The old chest was dismantled into pieces and fragments, which were then distributed to individuals. These fragments were carefully preserved in their homes for use when needed. The range of practices associated with these relic fragments was quite extensive. 
The wooden fragments, sometimes small splinters, at other times larger pieces or even entire boards, could be either ingested or placed in contact with the afflicted body part. In the former case, they were usually tiny fragments at, at times immersed in saints' water. In other instances, they were simply placed in contact with the afflicted area or secured to the skin using a bandage. This method bears similarities to the use of stones considered to possess healing properties, a practice that was prevalent, especially during the Middle Ages, as documented in numerous lapidaries. To remain within Catholic tradition, there, there are also clear folkloric influences, as seen in the writings of Hildegard of Bingen in her Book of Creatures. A particular intriguing case involves a child who was experiencing severe knee issues. The child's parents swaddled him and placed a wooden fragment within the bandages, allowing him to work for a day. Upon the next swaddling, the child had miraculously recovered. Furthermore, numerous healings took place during the procession of the urn containing the relics which traversed the entire town during the day of uh, the uh, religious festival. Those seeking healing would follow the procession, often walking in close proximity to the urn. The sudden recoveries of some individuals, officially verified by doctors, as we will explore shortly, were met with cries of the word mercy, or in Italian, misericordia. The investigation into the miracles attributed to Saint Angelo holds particular significance for another reason. In 1624, a devastating plague had spread from Palermo, resulting in the death of various individuals, including the viceroy of the island, Emanuele Filiberto di Savoia, and Cardinal Giannettino Doria was appointed as his successor. In response to the treat of the contagious disease, Licata, like other cities, implemented a specific measure, measures, such as permitting entry only to those with document certifying their good health, or organizing processions with the city within the city to seek divine protection. Nevertheless, in May, Jan 1625, one year later, the contagion also reached uh, Licata. It, it is noted that it initially emerged, according to some witnesses, from a cluster of houses situated behind the church that safeguarded the relics and miraculous water of Saint Angelo. The testimonies gathered during this time provide valuable insights into the disease, primary its symptoms. Those who fell ill with the plague, typically after an incubation period of three weeks following exposure, exposure to infected individuals or objects, exhibited symptoms including dizziness, fatigue, fever, joint pain, vomiting, and the distinctive swellings, referred to as bubo or bombone, particularly in the glands, armpits, neck, and groin. Once the doctors officially confirmed the presence of the plague in Licata, notably on, Jan, uh, on uh, 13 of Jan, which is St. Anthony's Day, as emphasized by many witnesses, a security system was put into action. The system included containment measures that were common in Italian cities and behind when, when dealing with contagion. The sick were urged to stay in their homes under the supervision of specific officials appointed by the University of Licata, the municipal uh, structure. The most severe cases where symptoms were already evident were relocated to designated areas initially used as a quarantine sites, such as caves and later a church. They would remain there until they either recovered or regrettably passed away. 
One noteworthy individual in this context was Agostino in Frigola, an expert in the field of medicine from Licata. According to his own testimony, he had acquired this medical knowledge during his travels, initially as a prisoner on galleys along the coast of Mediterranean Africa, including Barbary and Al Algiers, where plague outbreaks were not uncommon. He willingly entered the Licata quarantine facility, driven by a charitable spirit, and cared for the afflicted. Unexpected, as expected, the end of the contagion, in August of the same year, 1625, was attributed to the protection of Sant'Angelo. This was particularly emphasized because, as previously mentioned, the disease had initially emerged in houses near his church, which was interpreted as an attempt by the saint to contain its spread. During this period, various medical and miraculous remedies were employed. Medical treatments, as was often the case, were not always highly effective. The most valuable measures included home isolation and quarantine in the lazaretto, as they significantly curbed the transmission of the disease. Many residents also fled the town, seeking refuge in the countryside or in areas where the contagion had not yet reached. From a miraculous perspective, lamp oil, spring water and relics played a central role as remedies. The liquids were applied directly to the plague symptoms, typically resulting in their regression or in some cases the bursting of buboes, often filled with infected fluid frequently occurring at night, which will then spill onto the patient's bedding and clothing. Additionally, fragments of wood from the saint's chest were either ingested or, as previously mentioned, applied to the affected body parts, often with the use of bandages. <clears throat> In these instances as well, witnesses confirmed the regression of the disease. In some cases, witnesses noted the appearance of symptoms after a family member had already fallen ill and had been cured throughout the intervention of the saint. In such cases, the same miraculous remedy was applied. The role of doctors in the context of the miracles attributed to Saint Angelo is a significant aspect worth discussing. In the 113 depositions collected, doctors are frequently mentioned and some of them provided their testimonies. Uh, they generally make appearances when describe patients' illnesses, often to emphasize the improbability of being cured by conventional medical signs and to suggest that the only recourse was to make a vow to the saint. Many of the doctors mentioned in these cases displayed deep religiosity to the extent that their medical treatments were unfortunately described only rarely in the trial, were often just exposed with miraculous remedies. In some instances, they encouraged or personally administered miraculous water or applied the oil from the saint's lamp to the skin. This dynamic reveals a profound dialectic between medicine and thaumaturgy, showing that these aspects, these aspects were far from being in, oppos in opposition to one another. Doctors also played a direct role during the procession of the urn of relics, which wound their way throughout the town of Licata. They had to walk by the urn and consequently by the sick individuals. During various stops in the procession, which provided the bearers with opportunities to rest, doctors had the specific responsibility of checking and confirming the recovery of individuals. For example, they would declare that children with prominent hernias who had been examined in the past suddenly showed no signs of the ailment. Furthermore, the role of doctors was pivotal during the plague epidemic. They served at the lazaretto, caring for the sick, 
along with some prized. They were the ones who recognized the initial symptoms of the contagious disease in some of the diseases, aiding in the official declaration of the, arrive, of the arrival of the plague in the city. One particularly interesting case is that of Francesco Perconti, a physician from Licata. After witnessing the signs of the plague in some members of his household, he, too, fell ill. However, he chose not to report his illness to the health authorities and concealed to onset of symptoms. Aware that he was risking his own life, he turned to the saint, applying a fragment of the saint's chest to his own body in the areas where plaque symptoms had appeared. Eventually, he obtained a cure. This episode vividly illustrates the close relationship between medicine and recourse to tomatology. It demonstrates how even a doctor could exemplify this complex dialectic, which becomes even more pronounced in patients who sought only the most effective remedy available to them. The case of Sant'Angelo in Licata and the trial concerning his miracles indeed serves as an extremely intriguing source for the study of tomatology and medicine, along with providing insights into various other aspects such as material culture, law, society, and even animals. The trial documentation features a plethora of pathologies, at times described in using, using popular Sicilian terms. For instance, we have seen cases of hernias referred to as guallara and epilepsy as the children's disease. The text becomes even more illuminating when considered in pair with other contemporary sources from the same region. These sources can offer valuable insights into the history of both tomatology and medicine. Due to its new, unique historical and geographical characteristic and its interactions with proceeding knowledge and diverse cultures, Sicily proved to be a distinctive cultural labo laboratory. Its historical and geographical uniqueness, along with Sicily's contacts with various knowledge, tradition, and cultures, is exemplified by the case of the medical expert who claimed to have acquired substantial knowledge during his time in Bar Barbaria in Algeria. This cultural exchange and blending of medical and folkloric practices, saintly remedies and influences from Arab Islamic and Turkish cultures have contributed to a distinctly original outcome worthy of significant attention that I will provide uh, in the future. Sicily's rich and complex cultural landscape offers a unique lens through which to explore the intricate interplay between medicine, religion, and folk practices, shedding light on the development of these fields in a distinctive historical context. In conclusion, the example provided, as well as the geographical and, ju and judicial sources in general, offer valuable insights into the history of thematology. They help us understand the precious methods people employed to seek healing in sanctuaries, utilizing relics and objects associated with saints. And simultaneously, these practices illuminate the history of medicine during this period, demonstrating that recourse to saints, magical or folkloric practices, and consulting physicians were not necessarily contradictory. The practices linked to thaumaturgy are replete with references to various illnesses, efforts to find medical remedies, and collaboration with doctors in the application of specific treatments derived from both sanctuary and medical knowledge. Therefore, the study of this text enrich our comprehension of popular thaumaturgy while also providing a deep understanding of the history of medicine. Thank you for the attention. Thank you.